Red Dead Redemption 2 has lore jam-packed into every nook and cranny. Let's dig deep into the history behind the world and characters of Red Dead Redemption 2. Arthur Morgan, Dutch's right-hand man. Arthur Morgan has a pretty gruff exterior, but you can tell deep down inside, he cares for the people around him and would go to great lengths to protect them. Granted, his character can change drastically depending on how you play Red Dead Redemption 2, but his core personality remains consistent. Arthur's seen a lot of suffering, even before he made a living as an outlaw. By the time he was 11 years old, his parents were out of the picture, and during his teenage years, he was taken in by Dutch and Hosea. Arthur adopted Dutch's worldview. He cherished freedom and thumbed his nose at law and civilization. He became Dutch's most trusted enforcer. If he needed something done, Arthur would be the man to do it. Throughout his life, love never seemed to be on Arthur's side. He had a child with a waitress in his younger days, and despite his itinerant lifestyle, he visited them often, until one day, he found them murdered by some petty robbers. Ever since then, Arthur's pretty much avoided romance, and unfortunately, even when he does open up to another lover, Mary, it only ends in heartbreak. Now, Arthur didn't open up much to anyone, until he got tuberculosis. Once he's on death's doorstep, he starts confiding in others. For the most part, all he does is simply take orders and enforce Dutch's grand vision. Dutch Vanderlind, the charismatic leader. If you played the first Red Dead Redemption, then you already know how paranoid and selfish Dutch would end up becoming. But he wasn't always like that. In his earlier days, he truly believed in his vision of a world free from any and all government control. To make his dream a reality, he recruited a gang of like-minded outlaws to help him. Dutch used to have good ties with another gang leader named Colm O'Driscoll. Believe it or not, the two worked together. That is, until Dutch killed Colm's brother. In retaliation, Colm murdered Annabelle, a woman Dutch was seeing at the time. Since then, the name O'Driscoll has made Dutch's blood boil, but he never let it get in the way of being a man of the people. At least that's what he told himself he was. Dutch fearlessly led his gang through good times and bad, promising each and every person that he would lead them to a place where they could be free. The gang started with him and Hosea, but it quickly grew to include Arthur, John Marston, and a whole bevy of outlaws. The Vanderlyn Gang, outlaws with a heart of gold. Some might call the Vanderlyn Gang a no good group of outlaws, but to each other, they're more like family. Dutch, Hosea, and Arthur are all at the top of the chain of command, but everyone else does their part to make the camp feel like home. Pearson keeps everyone fed, while Strauss handles all the finances. This makeshift family embraces a diverse group of people. At the end of the day, what mattered most was loyalty to the group and accomplishing Dutch's goal of creating a free utopia. The Vanderlyn gang wouldn't make it to see the 20th century, but some stragglers still survived after the group disbanded. Sadie Adler and Mary Beth Gaskell, for example, started working as a bounty hunter and author respectively. These survivors put as much distance between them and the gang as possible, especially as everything started unraveling in 1899. Blackwater, where everything started to go wrong. Ah, Blackwater, the industrial capital of West Elizabeth. Cars replaced horses while cobblestone streets and lamps signaled the forward march of time. Oh, and there was a tragic shootout between the Vanderlyn gang and the Pinkertons. This one incident would spark the inevitable demise of Dutch's way of life. Dutch caught wind of a big heist opportunity on a boat docked at Blackwater's port, and gang newcomer Micah Bell encouraged him to pounce on it. Jose and Arthur thought it would be too risky, so they advised against it. But Dutch went ahead with the plan anyway. As you'd expect, the whole operation went wrong when Pinkerton agents came down on Dutch and the gang quickly. This led to a massive shootout that put the Vanderlyn gang at the top of the local most wanted list. Even worse, two gang members got killed, while others were lost in the fray. Among all the chaos, Dutch hit the money, hoping to retrieve it after things cooled down. No one gives Arthur a full picture of this massacre. All he gets are a few details popping here and there. It's a sore subject, even for Dutch. Nonetheless, the reckless decision causes people to start questioning Dutch's leadership. After the remaining members of the Vanderlyn gang escape Blackwater, they hole up in the cold mountains of Amberino. They need to make some extra cash, so Dutch orchestrates a train robbery. His main target, Leviticus Cornwall's money. Leviticus Cornwall, wealthy, powerful entrepreneur. Leviticus Cornwall is a man with friends in high places, and some low places too. He owns many businesses, including railroad and oil companies, and his ruthless cutthroat tactics have made him a wealthy man. He even has contacts in Guarma, an island in the Caribbean known for its sugar plantations. Before the Blackwater Massacre, Cornwall set a plan in motion to force the Wapiti Indians off their oil-rich land. When Cornwall learns that Arthur and his friends stole some money from one of his trains, he is understandably pretty mad. From then on, he works more closely with the Pinkertons to take down the dastardly Vanderlyn gang once and for all. In fact, he's so mad that he rides into Valentine personally to threaten Dutch for his actions. Valentine, a town about livestock. This little up-and-coming settlement commits a lot of its land to livestock, 
one of its bigger moneymakers. Heck, even Arthur and John herded some sheep to make extra cash. Nonetheless, people can still find ways to blow off some steam in this two-bar town. It's right by the train tracks. People can travel to and from Valentine with relative ease. For a good while, the Vanderlyn gang called Valentine, or more accurately, their camp just outside of Valentine, home. They did odd jobs to make ends meet and occasionally got into drunken brawls. And yes, they still made a dishonest living to get by. Unfortunately, robbing a Cornwall train has its consequences. The powerful entrepreneur forces the Vanderlyn gang to find a new home. Before we get there though, let's take a short, bloody tour to Strawberry. Strawberry, the wannabe resort destination. West of Valentine, you'll find Strawberry, a quaint little logging town with big dreams. At least that's what the mayor would want you to believe. Mayor Timmons comes from the more civilized East Coast, and he wants to make Strawberry a dream destination for the discerning tourist. The people around him, though, aren't really convinced. Even a traveler from New York thinks there's something funny going on in the mayor's brain. So, Strawberry was already a strange destination, but Micah had to go and ruin everything. At some point during their tenure in Valentine, Micah gets put in jail, and it's up to Arthur to break him out. And this isn't Metal Gear Solid. The prison break is very loud, very violent, and very deadly for all law enforcement involved. Arthur walks away from the encounter angry at Micah for being so reckless. Get used to that, cause Micah's just getting warmed up. Micah Bell, the snake in the grass. So, spoiler alert, Micah's not a good fella. I mean, good is a relative term when you're talking about a band of outlaws, but Mike is definitely something else. By the time he was 17, he was already wanted for murder alongside his father. He's also been known to wreak some havoc with his brother Amos, so he's basically lived a literal life of crime. In 1898, Micah saved Dutch's life during a bar brawl, so Dutch welcomed him into the gang. At least that's the story that Micah tells, so maybe take it with a grain of salt. After all, he's the one who dragged Dutch into the whole mess at Blackwater and he later betrays the entire gang by feeding information to the Pinkertons. If he never joined the Vanderlyn gang, things might have ended up differently for Dutch, Arthur, and everyone else involved. Rhodes, a tale of two families. After taking care of business in Valentine and Strawberry, Arthur and the gang make their way to the charming little town of Rhodes. Founded by U.S. Army Brigadier General Sherman M. Rhodes, this community found itself in the middle of a feud between two powerful families, the Greys and the Braithwaites. See, their bad blood goes all the way back to 1806. Both families had access to a huge stash of gold. But one day, a Grey stole some gold from the stash to start an abolitionist group. A few misunderstandings later, and both families ended up thinking the other one stole from the stash. And the rest is history. The Vanderlyn gang spends most of their time around Rhodes doing odd jobs for both the Greys and the Braithwaites, usually at the opposing family's expense. The Grey family owns the Rhodes Saloon, and the Braithwaites are pretty pissed about it. But things start to get serious when Catherine Braithwaite finds out that Dutch has been playing both sides and working with the Greys. In retaliation, she and her family kidnap Jack Marston, the youngest boy in the gang, and send him off to Angelo Bronte, an Italian crime lord in the grand city of Saint Denis. Saint Denis, the city of tomorrow. Arthur and Dutch may value the freedom of the outlaw lifestyle, but the average citizen of Saint Denis might think otherwise. With its paved roads and tram network, the capital of Lemoyne has more in common with Blackwater than Valentine. It's a city of industry, with factories that kick productivity and pollution into high gear. People dress nicely, and an established police force patrols the streets. In other words, it's a taste of what some call civilized society. However, that doesn't mean shady dealings aren't going on under the table. Angelo Bronte, a wildly successful criminal mastermind, schmoozes his way around the upper echelons of Saint Denis society. He strikes deals with the rich, but he's more than willing to backstab anyone to get what he wants. He even tries leading Dutch and the gang into a trap, which makes Dutch so mad that he kills Bronte. The city's new mayor, Henri Lemieux, isn't exactly above board either. While he may seem like an upstanding gentleman who appreciates the fine arts, he's got no qualms about contracting outlaws to do his dirty work. Nonetheless, Saint Denis is a place for opportunity, and Dutch knows it. He sets up a big heist at a local bank, hoping for one final big break. Instead, he loses two men and gets his gang stranded in the Caribbean. Guarma, the sugar plantation nation. After the botched heist, Dutch, Arthur, Micah, Bill, and Javier end up stranded on the small island nation of Guarma. Located off the east coast of Cuba, this island's main export is sugar. This lush jungle nation may look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, it's controlled by the ugliness of greed. Colonel Alberto Fusar rules the island with an iron fist, using his military to subjugate and enslave plantation workers. The sugar trade is lucrative, and even Leviticus Cornwall wants a piece of the action. 
When Arthur and the gang arrive on Guarma, they end up working with Hercule Fontaine, a Haitian revolutionary who wants to take down Fusar's regime. After dispatching Fusar, Arthur and the gang make their way back to America to pick up the pieces. The O'Driscoll Boys, an empire of outlaws. After that quick little island getaway, Arthur returns to the mainland and starts to take care of some unfinished business. One of those loose threads is none other than Colm O'Driscoll. Dutch's longtime rival built himself a mini empire of outlaws across the Wild West. The two gangs have crossed paths many times, and it almost always ends with some blood getting spilled. Case in point, during a supposed negotiation meeting, the O'Driscolls ended up kidnapping Arthur and torturing him. Things aren't necessarily all bad between the two gangs, though. Kieran Duffy, a lowly grunt in the O'Driscoll Empire, found himself a new lease on life in the Vanderlyn Gang. Granted, he had to work his way up to being even mildly respected, but he eventually became one of the family. That is, until he met a gruesome end at the hands of the vengeful O'Driscolls. Despite being captured by the law twice, Colm O'Driscoll always finds a way to get off scot-free. He could even escape the hangman. Unfortunately for him, his luck ran out on the third try, and Dutch made sure of that. The Pinkerton National Detective Agency, the law. The Pinkerton National Detective Agency are free agents that offer detective and security services, but the federal government often uses them to resolve major disputes. But it's not like they're loyal to the government. Anyone with enough money and power can hire them, including Leviticus Cornwall. Ever since the Vanderlyn gang robbed one of Cornwall's trains, the Pinkertons have been hot on their trails. The investigation, led by agents Andrew Milton and Edgar Ross, has continued to put more and more pressure on the outlaws. It started with a small meeting between Milton, Ross, Arthur, and Jack, where the two detectives tried to bargain with Arthur. Well, starting with that disastrous San Denis bank heist, things ramped up. Once Dutch and the gang got back from Guarma, the Pinkertons got a hold of Micah and started using him as an informant to track down the rest of the Vanderlyn gang. Agent Ross would continue to chase the Vanderlyn gang and its remnants for the next decade or so. Agent Milton, on the other hand, eventually meets his end at the hands of Abigail Roberts. Abigail Roberts, aka Abigail Marston. Abigail was introduced to the Vanderlyn gang in 1894, thanks to uncle, but her life before then wasn't exactly easy. She didn't exactly have parents and she had to make a living on her own from a young age. She worked in brothels and dive bars, and her life as a prostitute didn't really end after she joined the gang. It was a rough life, but she still managed to find true love with one person, John Marston. Abigail's experience made her strong, and she never hesitated to speak her mind. She even saves Arthur's life right before Agent Milton tries to kill him. After the Vanderlyn gang breaks up, Abigail ends up marrying John, and they spend the rest of their lives together. Well, the rest of John's life, at least. John Marston, the redeemed father. Before he starred in his own game, John Marston had a lot of stuff to figure out. John was born on a boat to America, but by the time he was eight, he ended up becoming an orphan just like his future wife Abigail. He survived on his own, stealing and killing as he needed to. One day, that life of crime almost got him killed, but Dutch stepped in to save his life, and John's been running with the Vanderlyn gang ever since. Okay, well, he did take a break from the Vanderlyns for a while. Soon after he and Abigail had their first child, he left the gang, worried about raising a son that might not be his own. He came back after a year, although his brother-in-arms, Arthur, found it hard to accept John after he abandoned them like that. Arthur had nothing to worry about, though. Ever since he came back, John's been a ride-or-die member of the Vanderlyn gang. He barely made it out of the Blackwater Massacre alive and he assisted Arthur and the gang through various missions throughout Red Dead Redemption 2. Sure enough, Arthur fully trusts John by the end of the adventure. In 1907, after the Vanderlyn gang is long gone, John tries to make an honest man of himself. He worked legitimate jobs and even built a ranch home for his family. I mean, sure, he occasionally goes off the beaten path to take some shady jobs every now and then, but it's all to make ends meet and support his family. When 1911 rolls around, Agent Ross tracks John down and basically hunts down the remaining members of the Vanderlyn gang, including Dutch himself. And at the end of John's long journey, Ross himself betrays John and has him gunned down. It isn't until 1914 that the Marston name gets the redemption it deserves. Jack Marston, bookworm turned gunslinger. Jack was the youngest member of the Vanderlyn gang. He was technically born into it. By the time he was four, the gang disbanded, but he saw everyone as extended family. Of course, he spent most of his time with his mom, Abigail, 
while John still wrestled with how to be a good father. Jack would also occasionally spend time with his uncle Arthur, who taught him how to fish. Throughout the tumultuous events of 1899, Jack gets kidnapped by the Braithwaites and held hostage by Angelo Bronte. At least Bronte was actually kind of nice to him. Right before Arthur passes, the outlaw trusts Jack to Tilly Jackson, who eventually reunites the kid with his parents. By 1907, Jack's a pretty scholarly kid. He gets lost in books about Western heroes and the Knights of the Round. You'd never even know he grew up in a gang of violent gunslingers. Jack wants to grow up and travel the world and become a lawyer. But if you beat Red Dead Redemption, you know that Jack's future involves more gunslinging than he would have liked. All right, so we've outlined the ins and outs of Arthur, John, and the Vanderlyn gang, and the world itself. Will Rockstar revisit this world again? Maybe with Jack at the helm. Whatever Red Dead Redemption game games next, you'll know we'll cover it on the leaderboard. So make sure you subscribe. From indie to AAA, we love the games you play. I've been your host, Justice, and thanks for watching.